Hello everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Hermitcraft Season 6. And the night is not upon us yet, but we can hear the terrifying screams of the Phantom. Where is this mysterious Phantom? What sort of madman has captured them and put them in a crazy cave to kill hermits? Mr. Doc M77 has done exactly that. And as the sun sets here, we do not actually have to worry too much because we're on a mushroom. Islands, the NHO Nature Preserve, where mobs don't actually spawn. Uh, but if we follow this path up to some skeletal remains of some sort of beast, we can enter the cave where the screams will get louder and the phantoms will terrify your dreams. I I'm so looking forward to this, if you can't tell. <laughs> Welcome back to another episode, everyone. Uh, I'm in a really good mood right now because we are starting this episode off with something I've been looking forward to doing for a while. The Phantom Death Run. Locker room. This is where I can go and uh, I can drop off my armor first of all and I can put all my belongings into a chest and I can actually set my spawn because it's night time so uh, timing was perfect I guess. So there is an instruction booklet here. It says welcome to the Phantom Death Run. Only the best and strongest Minecraft players, for example anyone but the NHO and hermits can master this challenge. If you hesitate you are dead. Make sure to carefully read the instructions. Press the button on the redstone lamp once. Don't spam, you fall. Pass through the airlock doors and walk straight through as soon as the doors open. Look at the phantom in front of you and wait. You cannot hit any phantoms. There is a fine if we do that. And we have to put all our belongings in a chest, which we have done. Uh, you cannot take any items except food. It challenges us not to take food, but I am a wimp. I am scared of these phantoms, to be honest. And I'm going to take some food with me. Uh, skip the next page if you don't want any hints. I'll take a hint. Uh, at the end of the cave, look for a diving part to make it closer to the exit. Okay. Okay, that's probably quite a valuable hint if you didn't know that. Alright, I've actually got my volume turned down a little bit. Because it's kind of difficult to talk with the screeches of phantoms. But through we go. This is the, the airlock bit, right? Oh, and it's kind of dark as well. I'm going to adjust my blinds. So the room is darker and it's easier to see the screen. That was very, very smart of me. Right, and now we've got to wait here until we... Oh, I see the phantom, actually. The phantom is now coming towards us. And that has activated some redstone and sent us all the way down here. Whoa, okay. Now we're in the cave where the phantoms... They could be anywhere. And I'm bobbing around like a buffoon. Where are the phantoms? Can I... Oh, God! I'm... Something happened. Uh, let's look for a downwards part. Okay, there's... Oh, down. Go down. Okay, okay. No, I think it followed me in here. Jeez, keep swimming. Keep swimming. Oh, my goodness me. Did, I haven't seen a phantom yet. I, I don't know where they are. Okay, I think we have to go up there. That looks purposeful. I'm going to die here. Mr. Phantom, please leave me. Let me escape. I just want... I can kind of sit here and reach... Oh, no, I can't. Here we go. It's the second phantom death run. Right, move. <laughs> Just move, move, move. And don't. We know where to go now. Let's try and jump on the blocks. That's a good strategy. We move through there quickly. Oh, go underwater, please. Why am I bobbing upwards? Why was I bobbing upwards? I just wanted to peacefully go under the water. Okay, the phantom is probably following me. And, and now we've tried the right-hand side. I think we... No, 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 no. Okay. I actually really not sure where to go now. Oh, it goes back around that way. Oh, goodness me. Come on. I can barely move. It's so annoying. Okay, keep moving. Keep moving. Around the corner. Up there. Up there. Yes. Is that it? Oh. Oh, I did it just dying once. That was utterly terrifying, my friends. And I happen to know that I guess I now have the lowest score. I'm in one death. Just one. Uh, but the other hermits have been through here with zero deaths. So there is a thing here where you can note down your deaths and the episode number, which I think is 726 for this one, right? Alright, mine neatly fits onto a line if I remove a space here and uh, just put death instead of deaths. And there you go. Must not sign the book. Must not sign it. So our buddy Doc M has obviously put an extraordinary amount of effort into that project, capturing the phantoms and if you're heading over his channel to check out his videos and subscribe to him to see how he did all of this uh, be sure to leave a comment and let him know the X sent you over there um, because man Doc M 
The, the guy who helped me get my channel going. Little bit of history for you. Back in the day after I made my first few videos, he gave me a shout out. He helped the, the ball go get rolling for my channel. And uh, it's absolutely wonderful to now have him on the server. And this is superb. The Phantom Death Run, my friends. I definitely enjoyed that. Pun intended. Definitely. <laughs> Now I'm very aware that this doesn't make for an exciting video walking through a nether tunnel but as we head back I unfortunately need to break the fourth wall and speak to you for a moment about the last episode. I had quite a bit of negative feedback with Evil X being tagged. I do say quite a bit, it's usually a vocal minority but some people thought that I was copping out by making Evil X uh, tagged. Now, let me tell you something. I am absolutely happy with playing this game without a helmet or some leggings. It really doesn't make too much difference once you've been playing this game for a long time. You know how to survive. And with Evil X being tagged, it gives me the opportunity to have some shenanigans on the server the likes you're not going to see, you know, on a normal Let's Play, right? And here's the thing. Evil X doesn't have anything. No diamonds, no armor, no tools, no elytra, no rockets. It's going to be even harder for Evil X to pass the tag onwards. In a way, I've made the challenge harder for myself. Uh, but the real reason that Evil X is being tagged is because we want to kind of put the game on ice just for a moment as we build the tag headquarters, re-establish the rules and make things clear for everyone. We're going to evolve the game, add a new, few new things to it and make a clear record of who's tagged and make it easier for you, the viewers, to understand who is tagged each time. And so it should work out to be better all in all. And we're not going to be working on the tag building this episode. I don't know when we're actually going to start it. It might be two or three episodes down the line. I've got to get inspired, get my building cap on first of all, you know. But when we get to building that, uh, then Evil X will be certainly attempting to try and tag some other hermits. Anyways, as of right now, we've got a little bit of preparation to do. I need to do resource gathering. And I have used my shovel up so much that I won't be able to repair it again. So I plan on getting uh, a mending book attached to my shovel. I've been doing some overnight fishing and I've got a mending book right here. But I thought it would also be a good idea to just revise my armor and see if I wanted to make any modifications here. So we've got protection 4. I like to have four pieces with protection 4 and then one of them with fire protection. And not my chest plate because we might take that off when we're using our elytra. Uh, I have fire protection on my boots but I'm actually going to swap it around and put it on my leggings because I've got fire protection and mending over here and the leggings is the one piece of armor that currently doesn't have fire protection. Uh, that's not the anvil, I clicked on the wrong thing. If we put them in around this way you'll see that the projectile protection stays. If we swap them around the other way we get fire protection. Just in case that's something you didn't know, um, these types of fire protection and projectile protection can replace one another but it depends on the order you put them in here. If you are to try and replace protection itself though, uh, it never gets replaced by either of those. So we've got protection 4 for our boots, I have a protection 3 book to upgrade this to protection 4 and then we've got that mending book for our shovel. Problem is we're going to need loads and loads of levels to do all of this stuff. Oh wait a minute, that's right the shovel is too expensive. We can't repair it, we can't put a mending book on it so we're going to have to make a new one from scratch and all of this is going to cost us a lot of XP and this farm just isn't fast enough. This place is becoming very popular. There's some guardians outside of here as well. I'm not sure if that's normal or not. But this is Cubfan and Iskal's Guardian Farm. We're sort of at the entrance bit here. You can see the Guardians dropping down into the killing chamber over there. This place has become very popular, but I've noticed that you have to put your items back into this chest after you're done using the farm. And then Iskal and Cub, they take those items, they put them in the shop and sell it back to us. We're essentially farming the items for them to sell to us. It's kind of silly. But anyway, you walk up to it here. You give the Guardians a whack and you get tons of XP and you've got to take off your armor because of course the Fawns could damage it. So for this episode and other projects that I have going on we're going to need a ton of sand which is why I've come out here and filled up uh, two shulker boxes full and a little bit in my backpack as well. And it doesn't take that much time at all really. I've cleared out this space, you can see the beanstalk off in the distance and we've come as far out as uh, another biome over here. Because this area was really flat, it kind of made it very easy just to go side to side and get tons of sand quickly. Another resource we're going to need is an underwater light source. 
sea lanterns would be suitable and this farm has actually been kind of great we've put literally no effort into building this thing and now we can probably make about two stacks of sea lanterns oh yeah and all my crops have been destroyed by guardians that spawn in this room and then get out of the water and jump around flapping their tails everywhere and you know what there's a lot of pigmen in this area there's, there's quite a few of them look they're hanging out all over the place Finally, we are back here and uh, I don't need to set up any spell trees for our glass. We can always just use this for something else as well. So I've stocked this up with sand which will give us plenty of glass for what we're going to be building out there in the ocean. Uh, but first of all, we've got to take on a problem with some of the redstone. And the problem is the redstone itself, which is kind of unnecessary. As much as I enjoyed making this clock design and getting it to activate the dispensers to send the items upwards. I was talking to Nembom about what I'd come up with and he pointed out that it's kind of unnecessary. If we were to rip out all of these hoppers and the redstone, we could actually organically move the kelp that falls over the edge here into the, the water stream with the soul sand. Well, this is very, very simple and I've built it using oak leaves, which are temporary because I still don't know the build palette for this. We're going to figure that out soon enough but yes very simple concept the water is now stopped by the signs so the kelp will drop into these streams and you'll notice here where the source blocks are in the middle they don't flow inwards I'm not sure if that's like a 1.13 bug or water just doesn't do that in that spot but it could be a little bit of a problem for the kelp wishing in from the side like that it gets directed to the middle that's good but if it were to drop in straight from above it may just get stuck there in fact it looks like the other ones wished all the way across and they kind of need to come back again. Ah, of course. Because the two water sources had only one block between, they formed the water source. So we actually had three of them in total. So it kind of there wasn't anything wrong with the water. Look, you see, that's a water source and that is flowing over to the side. So what we shall be doing next is building a cage, a wall. Uh, I don't know what you want to call it, really. But that's why I've smelted up so much glass because... We are actually going to come right down here to the bottom of our farm and build up some walls up to the surface. Now this is going to serve two purposes. One will be purely aesthetic to make this look like some sort of kelp aquarium built inside of an ocean. <laughs> and the other thing is to hopefully stop some of our kelp going off to the side here. Uh, my stand-in X, as I think Wells Knight called him, <laughs> this little turtle guy right here has been looking after the farm and keeping an eye on it. And uh, yeah, what we essentially need to do is bring the wall all the way up to the top here and have it go all the way across to the other end. And then the kelp should stay on the inside. So you can see here the kelp is coming out to the side when it's getting broken. And hopefully doing this will fix that problem. Now the colour I want to make this is light blue. Yeah, I want to go with light blue glass. And I've also been wrestling with what material to use. I really, really want to use prismarine, but I was thinking my farm hasn't made enough drops and I don't want to spend loads and loads of diamonds on someone else's shop. But then I remembered that I have this ender chest. So I think this is going to be our material of choice. So we're going to start off with this, I think. Uh, two bars running across, which will probably be most of the way since this is kind of the deepest point so we've got a 7 by 7 area here which we're going to fill up with glass and it all needs to be flat so any of the kelp down low will rise up on the edge here and then at the bottom where we have some terrain on the opposite side I figured rather than use the grass let's go and fill this stuff in like so so that'll come across in line with the gravel and that block there would be incorrect and then we'll put glass in these spaces so from out the front here, the thing looks a little bit dull at the moment, which is absolutely fine. I crafted up some prismarine stairs that we could put uh, where these beams go across. And we'll extend like the, the pillar here out by a block and then do it again. So the base gets wider the further down it goes. Uh, this will look good in this area and definitely on the other side where it goes a lot lower. But as we get higher up, it might not really bring too much to the build, which is... Okay, I guess. So what I think we might do is also put like a design in the glass. Perhaps just like a little star, a little X or something. There's really not too much we can do there. But if we change the colours to white or maybe even blue, we can add a little extra something. So I was never bothered by where this would end up aligning with. If it comes out to this space, we will find a way to make this work. That's not a problem. 
One thing that has crossed my mind is that because I've built this top bit first, I've got a way to walk down to the other end where I might need to do some work. And at night time, mobs are going to be able to spawn on those blocks, right? So what if we were to put those in there? They would also be waterlogged. So I believe that means from our myth busting test that nothing will be able to spawn on there. I'm not sure if you could call this a proper test, but look at what's going on. The flying machine is coming towards us. And so the kelp that it's pushing should, in theory, never go out to the side. But I'd be interested to see if any of it ever lands on top of the glass. That could be a potential problem, couldn't it? But it doesn't look like it. I'll keep my eye on that. So here's a big problem. We've got kelp and it's not getting pushed along. The reason being that we don't have water at the same height as the slime blocks anymore. This is because of the walls that I put on either side. I really should have thought of that first. But now I'm wondering... Uh, what is the solution to this? Because obviously I can go ahead and remove uh, all of these, right? And then the water should make its way back across the other side. Or maybe that there is also stopping it. We could change that to a slab, I guess. But if we do this, um, are the items actually going to stay in the tank? Or are they going to find a way to get pushed over? That's the next thing to figure out. So yeah, let's actually go and rip this all out from the top layer and see what happens. So it's nothing but good news now. We've got a good old Minecraft grind ahead of ourselves as we build up all of this. But it looks like we are good. I've been observing the kelp and all of it has been landing inside the edge of this wall. And then getting pushed over to the end here. Now I've also got a theory that the hoppers that we had before with the dispensers were actually losing a fair amount of kelp. As I've just been over to check how the furnaces are doing and eight of them are lit up at once. So that seems to suggest that we were actually losing a lot of kelp with our previous setup. So, as I said, everything is looking good at the moment. When we started this project, I was very aware that things would be changing rather often, and I'm absolutely fine with that. What we're going to be doing is changing the bottom flying machine and actually raising it up a little bit, and that's based on how we're currently using the farm. And just from stepping back here, by the way, uh, this is looking pretty cool. That's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to move around and give you a view of this as we head over to the lower flying machine. So the kelp doesn't really get too much of a chance to grow because we activate these machines quite awfully to send a lot of kelp over there to continuously smelt. So what I'm thinking of doing is raising this up so that the kelp can grow higher, but then we can plant more kelp overall without having to do extra work. Ah, and that's another reason that some of the kelp comes back this way is because, of course... The kelp grows when the machine comes back, so we are going to have to build a collection system at this end as well, basically. But if we were to raise this up, the kelp would grow to the height of the flying machine, and it would still grow. And then it could go further over in this direction. So what I think we're going to do is probably raise it to around somewhere here, and just dig down a little bit of this in front of the collection area, so we don't make too much digging uh, work for ourselves. And then we can get more kelp. I just wanted to say, being inside of this tank is uh, wonderful, <laughs> and I'm extending these leaves so we can put the flying machine at the exact correct height. It's also reminded me of something as well. We should have leaves in the middle, because sometimes the kelp gets caught underneath here, but that is a job for another day, and now I've got to move all of this upwards. The moment of truth is now upon us, my friends. Have I redstoned correctly, or slimestoned as it's called? So this thing needs to come over here and bounce off and go back the other way. Oh yes, and it does it first time. And now for that all-important second moment of truth. Is this all set up correctly? The signal has been transferred upwards, it's going across. And yes, everything is just fine. The items here are not going up to the surface. And I think I know why. I think when we dug away all of these blocks the source water wouldn't have spread across from the front. So if I were to drop down items here, they're probably eventually going to start rising, yeah. So I think what we need to do is take our water bucket and make sure that these are like water sources going all the way across here. And they start to rise, but then they fall again. Why do they do that? It's because this level here isn't water sources as well. So I basically got to do that over and over again until they rise all the way to the top. So every single spot has been filled in and a thought just crossed my mind. If the kelp has less to travel upwards, then by the time the second machine comes back, more of it would have reached the surface. So that's even less losses from this farm. So the efficiency has been increased massively at this point. 
And that, of course, means we need more furnaces. So the the third of fifth has now been set up. And for even sake, with this going directly across at a diagonal, I push that back into the wall a little bit, as you can see. Uh, now we're just waiting for the kelp to come through. We're running five furnaces at the moment. And as more and more of the kelp grows taller, more and more will get harvested each time. So I've timed this perfectly for another AFK session. Uh, but before we do that, we've got to get ourselves some fuel together. There is a ridiculous amount of this stuff that has been smelted. <laughs> and uh, I've set up my inventory correctly this time, so now we can craft tons of the stuff. And there we go, that is plenty of fuel. And I've just realised something. Around the back here, um, you will see that these hoppers are filtered with some sand, so that we don't have all of it stocked up with dried kelp block. And these ones here, I totally forgot to do that, so I kind of need to replace all of these. So after another lengthy AFK session, we are still not producing enough dried kelp to have an excess. However, where I've expanded these furnaces and they're not being used, most of our dried kelp has just been sunk into these hoppers, as you can see. And it goes all the way to this bit here. So we need to back it up all the way across there before we start to take the excess from the farm. So it might take a fair bit of time before we actually get uh, enough to do that. And I'm thinking now that a lot of the project with the kelp farming over there and expanding it will now start to just happen on live streams and I'll keep you informed of when we expand things. But when we get that dried kelp access, that's when we'll be able to move on to providing a service for the community, which is free smelting. And what I need to do is go into statistics. I wanted to show you something here. Um, it is in items. Let's go to times crafted. Look at that. 11,960 dried kelp have been crafted. Incredible stuff. That number will go up and up throughout the season, I'm sure. Anyway, that is going to be it from me this episode of Hermitcraft. I do hope that you have enjoyed it. If you have, uh, leave a like. As always, thank you so much for the support. And I will see you soon with another episode of Hermitcraft. So ciao for now. Bye bye.